In L.A. this week, Mayor Eric Garcetti makes it official as he signs the minimum wage ordinance, increasing the pay for working class Angelinos. It's one of L.A.'s hottest attractions, but why visiting this sign has become a nuisance for the Beachwood community. I'm Rasha Goel, and that story's up next. Outgoing council member Tom LaBonge looks back on four decades of public service. Hello and welcome to LA This Week. Thanks for joining us. I'm Yana Kay. Our top story this week, history has been made. Los Angeles now leads the way when it comes to wage equality for its lowest paid workers. Anna Marcos takes us to the signing of LA's new minimum wage bill. The mayor's signature makes it official. An historic wage increase for the poorest working Angelinos just became law. One out of four of us live in poverty. This is about that the idea, that American ideal when someone works hard, they should be able to support themselves and they should be able to support their families. Starting a year from now, LA's minimum wage will go up to 10.50 an hour, with the amount increasing each year until it hits 15 an hour in 2020. After that, wages will increase annually based on the consumer price index. Businesses with 25 or fewer workers will get an extra year before each wage increase, and teen workers will be paid on a lower scale. In my district, uh, you know, I'm hopeful that several hundred thousands of individuals are going to be able to, to get a minimum wage. Uh, I'm talking about the, 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 uh, the janitors, the, the, the cooks, the, the dishwashers, uh, those who are struggling working three or four jobs. I'm a low-wage construction worker who will now be able to help my mom with rent and get off public assistance. Garcetti will also set up an Office of Labor Standards to investigate cases of wage theft and to make sure workers get the wages they have earned. And he disagrees with some merchants who claim that the wage increase will put many out of business. Businesses and restaurants and retail outlets can still survive and thrive. In fact, they do better when people have money in their pockets to spend. After us, you saw the county, they want to pass a minimum wage increase. You see the state of California wants to pass a minimum wage increase. And as you look across this nation, city after city. By all accounts, L.A. is set to become a national role model for revving up the economy by revving up worker salaries. I'm Anna Marcos for L.A. This Week. Studies show 97% of LA's minimum wage workers are adults and over 80% are people of color. Mayors from two of LA's sister cities visit downtown to create trans-Pacific partnerships on a smaller scale. As Gil Reyes reports, unlike Washington, there's no congressional gridlock to stop them. As President Obama's 12-nation Trans-Pacific Partnership plan met opposition from his own party in mid-June, three city mayors bypassed the gridlock to forge their own Pacific PACs. Your presence here proves that local government is getting things done. Sometimes national governments take a longer time to approve, to study, to look at things, but mayors are nimble. Specifically, these mayors, Auckland, New Zealand's Len Brown and Guangzhou, China's mayor Chen Chanhua. They met over breakfast with our own mayor, Eric Garcetti, for what was billed as the Tripartite Summit at the Millennium Biltmore Hotel. They talked transportation, trade, tourism and entertainment. Also goods movement between the three ports and investment opportunities. And we can learn from each other, steal the best ideas and find a way to uplift the quality of life for all of our peoples. Their commitment to work together began last fall during Mayor Garcetti's visit to China. A mayoral summit in Auckland, New Zealand is set for next year. City governments forming economic alliances in case national governments can't. In downtown LA, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. LA Sister Cities program encourages goodwill and collaboration between LA and 25 other international cities. Well, a hot Hollywood attraction has become a distraction for those living in the area. Rasha Goel has more. Residents are saying they have had enough. While they don't mind tourists coming to see the famous Hollywood sign, the thousands of visitors coming to their neighborhood has become a nuisance over the years. I clean up broken glass from beer bottles, from liquor bottles. I have cleaned up soiled baby diapers. 
Um, hold your ears, delicate listeners. I have swept away used condoms. Um, and then other more prosaic, but nonetheless offensive garbage like fast food wrappers. Laura says even parking for residents can be a problem. If you leave your house on Saturday or Sunday to go do errands, you will not have a parking space when you get back, period. Period. The city is looking to put up signs here along Beachwood Drive, just south of Ledgewood Drive and right before the business complex at the end of the street. The signs would not allow visitors to park between the hours of 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. seven days a week. It's been a long time because uh, it's been a challenge. I still want public access to the park. I still want the trails open, but I want to protect the neighborhood from the overwhelming cars that fly up the street. While Laura and other residents are supportive of City Council's proposal to expand parking restrictions, businesses in the area say new parking regulations will have a negative impact on their bottom line. Among them is Patricia Carroll of Hollywoodland Realty Company, whose building has been there since 1923. She's also a resident in the area. It would basically kill our commerce in any way possible. Uh, we felt very blindsided in this situation because we weren't even aware of the hearings where we could input information. She's hoping some type of solution will be reached that can help both the business owners and residents. But for now, this iconic sign is the only one that residents and visitors can both agree on. In Hollywood, I'm Rasha Goel for LA This Week. The city has asked the Department of Transportation to provide recommendations for expanding parking restrictions in residential areas near the Hollywood sign. Any parking changes would require the approval of at least 67% of residents. While it's been a month of farewells for council members who are termed out of office, but one going away party had a bit of an artistic flair. Anna Marcos has more. He's been fondly known as Mr. L.A. Outgoing District 4 Council Member Tom Labonte has made his mark as a photographer, artist, city historian, nature lover, city leader, and guardian of all things L.A. I thank all those who I've served under, uh, whether it's Mayor Bradley or Mayor Reardon or uh, uh, when I was there and then as elected uh, with my colleagues on the City Council, especially Janice Hahn, who's my best friend. And uh, I'm proud of Eric Garcetti, now our mayor, what he's done. and. Herb Wesson, I've known the longest, I believe, so uh, it's been very special. Even his farewell to the city wasn't just a civic affair, but an artist reception, featuring Labonja's own photography of the City of Angels. What do you think he should do next? Um, be a cameraman. He takes a lot of good pictures. You see all these pictures are on the wall. Labonja has served the City of L.A. since 1976, working as city council staff, then at DWP, before he was elected as council member of the 4th District in 2001. Over the years, he's changed a bit, though his love for Mickey Mouse hasn't. And no LeBonge retrospective would be complete without his favorite gift, pumpkin bread, showing up in the picture. Even the president got a homegrown loaf at one point. He is such a man of the people. He is so evocative of what Los Angeles really is. He's very committed and he's very much cares and he's easily one of the biggest fans of Los Angeles. LaBonge, it seems, leaves plenty of fans behind. He said that he might think about teaching, but I hope he runs for mayor when Garcetti's term is finished because we really all love him so much. Mayor, teacher, Griffith Park patron, saint and hiker, who knows? But we think in some way we'll be seeing him around. I'm Anna Margos for L.A. This Week. LaBonja's last day in office is June 30th. And as he counts down to his last days in office, Councilman LaBonja took the opportunity to reflect on four decades of public service. Gil Reyes has more. So here we are, three, two, one. You hear me okay? Hey, here comes Vadim. Get out of here, Vadim. Vadim's, the, Vadim's the youth. Uh, he goes on, but I'm out. He'll I'm be out, out all right. Months, L.A. City Councilman months, Tom LaBonge, the most boisterous of L.A.'s elected leaders, termed out of his job in July. Closing on 14 years, almost 14 years as a council member. So over the course of time, I've collected a lot of things. Come on in. LaBonge, who represents parts of Hollywood, the Miracle Mile, and Sherman Oaks, shows us. His soon-to-be-vacated City Hall office is packed with mementos from his district. 
art from constituents, so cool, relics yeah. like this piece of Please curb from the former home of Walt Disney. There are maps, plaques, and proclamations dedicated to the folksy, football-loving former uh, jock from Marshall pretty. High School. Lisa, how's that report, dude? You gonna have it done today? Oh, yes, I am. All right, now take a minute. Don't always be a busy bee. Wave to the camera. <laughs> okay. Good. Here's a picture of me right here. That's Pat O'Brien, and that is Lou Holtz. He also UCLA, shows us photographs. LaBange, an amateur photographer, worked for NFL Films before politics. Prior to becoming councilman, he also spent 26 years working for the city in various roles, mostly as chief deputy to former council president John Ferraro. Altogether, that's 40 years in public service. When you're from Los Angeles and you're able to contribute in a way like I have, it's a very good feeling to know that, you know. I haven't made everybody happy, haven't solved every problem. As councilman, LaBange clashed with activists over the LA Zoo's elephant exhibit. They called it inhumane and sued to close it. They lost. People have also criticized increased development and McMansionization in his district, but he's fought to preserve open space. Well, I think the proudest moment for as a representative is to be able to buy the land in Coinga Peak, the open space near the Hollywood sign. If you look over here at this picture here, Everything here was private land they could have built on it. Now it's park land. This added over 100 acres to his beloved Griffith Park. LaBange hikes there almost daily. His knowledge of the city has earned him the nickname Mr. Los Angeles, and he plays it up for the cameras. I can't help in love. As LA's booming Goodwill Ambassador and chair of LA's Sister Cities program, LaBange almost always puts on a good show leaving crowds smiling or bewildered, oftentimes both. So what's next for the man famous for handing out pumpkin bread made by Dominican nuns to people he meets? Will he ride off into the sunset of Griffith Park? Sometime in the future i got to get a job because my children will still be in college and my wife doesn't want to run the house all day long. Are you ruling out politics? Uh, not ruling it out, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to Sacramento. People have asked me to be a United States Senator and I laugh. I'll tell you this, there's nothing like having this job to help people and to work with people who are into helping people. This is Tom LeBonge from Council District 4 signing off to Channel 35, but I hope to come back uh, on a rerun. Best wishes to Mr. Los Angeles. Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Councilman LeBonge plans to donate a lot of the memorabilia in his office to the LA City Library and local universities. He also hasn't ruled out teaching or a job in the tourism industry. While the plan to improve the travel experience for passengers at the Los Angeles International Airport continues with rapid renovations. Raja Goel has more on the latest upgrades at the Delta Terminal. Raja. Yana, I'm here at LAX at the Delta Airlines Terminal, and right behind me you can see the new expanded ticket lobby. Now, this is just one of the many changes that has happened in this terminal. And, of course, all of this is part of the bigger picture of the LAX $8.5 billion modernization plan. The $229 million project for Delta Airlines also includes... Over the past three years, Delta has doubled the size of the ticketing lobby renovated their baggage claim and built the beautiful Delta Sky Club, where they'll open their first ever exclusive check-in area that uh, we've been talking about, complete with renovated bathrooms and, get this, new shower suites. It is the first time Delta anywhere in our system has built a dedicated premium first-class check-in facility. The goal is to overall improve customer experience at the second busiest airport. In April, we opened a $438 million central utility plant, a major infrastructure investment that's 25% more efficient than before. In January, we opened four new gates at Tom Bradley Terminal, uh, one of the finest terminals now in North America. Collectively, on capital improvement at LAX, we are spending an average of $4.5 million per day. Officials say Delta has been the fastest growing carrier since 2009. And the work done on this terminal alone uh, helped us to have a thousand additional jobs, good paying construction jobs, in addition to the 2,800 jobs that Delta already has here. Delta Airlines is also looking to expand the number of locations they fly to. They currently serve 53 destinations and already have plans to add more destinations to the list this summer. Yana. Rasha, thanks. According to airport officials, in the first quarter of this year, LAX accommodated a million and a half more passengers when compared to previous years. 
And while LAX is seeing a boost in passengers, Los Angeles fire stations are experiencing a boost of their own as critical services are restored at one firehouse in Los Feliz. Los Angeles Fire Station 35 is back to doing what it does best, serving the community and saving lives. That's because the station is now back to operating with full capacity. Well, now we have an engine, a fully staffed engine company with four people, and then we have a fully staffed truck company, and then two fully staffed uh, rescues, one paramedic rescue and one BLS rescue, which allows us to be fully staffed in the uh, Los Feliz district. LAFD and city officials came out recently to rededicate the station as a full service task force. I just think it's really important that we have good support from the fire department and they do a wonderful job. In 2011, during the height of the recession, the station had to cut one fire engine and four firefighters from service. But now that services have been restored, officials say firefighters can get back to doing their jobs. In every neighborhood they are, and they are extremely efficient, uh, but they need support because not just the regular day-to-day -day activities, we all know what Dr. Lucy Jones says, the big one will come, and these are our absolute first responders. LAFD officials said Fire Station 35 was the first to get its resources returned because it's close to popular destinations such as Griffith Park, nightclubs and several major hospitals. LAFD Chief Ralph Terraza said even more support is on its way in the form of a nurse practitioner unit to help respond to 911 calls. This new unit will go out there and address the needs of that patient. It's just below a doctor level. They can do stitches, they can write prescriptions, they can take them to a substance abuse center, they can take them to a mental health clinic, all the things that we can't do right now. Terrazas, who became chief of the department last year, said 54 new firefighters were also recently hired, and he said he will be requesting five new classes for the next fiscal year. With Fire Station 35 fully restored, LAFD now has 31 complete task forces. While some of the finest high school filmmakers in the county compete for exposure on the big screen, Gil Reyes reports from the Los Angeles Student Film Festival, a festival created by City Councilman Paul Krikorian. Many of these filmmakers exhibit depth and creativity well beyond their high school years. Senior Riley Barris directed not your typical documentary, but a sockumentary to help the homeless. We collect socks, undergarments, and hygiene products for the homeless, and we distribute them back to the homeless population in the streets. So it's about raising awareness and promoting donations for the homeless. Her film, one of 37, selected to screen at the Los Angeles Student Film Festival at El Portal Theater in North Hollywood. LA City Councilman Paul Krikorian created the program. An opportunity to explore a different side of themselves that maybe they didn't even know was there. Some of these kids have never picked up a camera before they entered this, uh, this festival. Um, but at the same time, there are also some very serious filmmakers who are no doubt going to go on to a career in this industry, so we're helping to develop the next generation of filmmakers. Animators, too. Students spent months painstakingly crafting their animated films using Adobe Photoshop and iMovie. It was all hand-drawn, so it was just like um, picking pictures and putting it all together into one single stop motion. It was so much work, but once seeing it like finished and crisp and clear and beautiful, I'm like, yes, this is our baby. And I'm super excited to be able to present it here. Students also got to wear many different hats, juggling duties as actors, directors, and producers. We all helped produce it, we all helped edit it. And it was like one of the first things we've ever created together and one of my first collaborations. And hopefully not the last for these talented young filmmakers. In North Hollywood, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Only 37 student films were selected out of some 200 submissions throughout LA County. Well, it's one of the most critically acclaimed shows on television, and most of it was shot right here in L.A. For all of its contributions to the city, City Council recognized the crew and creator of Mad Men. That's the focus of This Week in Tweets. The AMC hit Mad Men was honored by Councilmember Paul Krikorian at City Hall, declaring June 17th Mad Men Day in Los Angeles. On hand for the honor were show creator Matthew Weiner and other cast and crew members. Nostalgia. It's delicate, but potent. It's a twinge 
Krikorian, who was also chair of the city's film and TV production jobs committee, tweeted, Wednesday, June 17th is Mad Men Day in Los Angeles. This historic show created hundreds of TV jobs over the last eight years. Jijun Wilson at Pinky Avalon tweeted, Congrats to Mad Men team being honored by LA City Council, declaring June 17th officially Mad Men AMC Day in LA. Our own Rasha Goel, who was at City Hall, tweeted a pic of Krikorian speaking at the podium of Council Chambers. She tweeted, Mad Men creator, cast, crew recognized at LA City Council for keeping production in LA. Shot almost entirely in Los Angeles, Mad Men generated about $200 million to LA's economy during its seven-year run on AMC. Krikorian said the production created hundreds of steady jobs for actors, writers, and below-the-line production workers. Mad Men wrapped its seventh and final season this spring. And that's a look at This Week in Tweets. While U.S. veterans are recognized, a historic community in Elysian Park gets its name carved in stone, and the bidding begins as city leaders ask Internet companies to take part in their CityLink LA initiative. All these stories and more in City Beat. More than 200 veterans and guests recently came out for the third annual Council District 12 Interfaith Breakfast at New Horizons in North Hills. This biannual event, entitled A Time for Gratitude, focused on celebrating the selfless service and sacrifice of all veterans, while at the same time exploring issues such as employment, housing, benefits, and mental health. A panel of federal, state, and local experts shared their knowledge and expertise with those in attendance. Councilmember Gil Cedillo and the Department of Recreation and Parks unveiled a monument to recognize the historic Solano community within Elysian Park. The Solano community is the last remaining residential community within Elysian Park after several other neighborhoods were removed in the mid-1950s to make room for Dodger Stadium. The location of the monument is on a 0.10-acre portion of Elysian Park, which was donated to the City of Los Angeles in 2008. The City Council is now accepting bids from companies interested in offering free or low-cost internet access across the city. As part of the CityLink LA program, the city is looking for internet providers that can offer reduced rate and free wireless internet service for low-income communities. The providers would also set up a network with one gigabyte or higher speeds for homes and businesses. In return, the internet providers would get access to city-owned assets and get other incentives such as bulk lease rates on the city's fiber networks, as well as a streamlined permitting process. City officials said the goal is to offer Internet access to everyone in the city, including those who cannot currently afford to get online. The City of Los Angeles has made a serious commitment to this initiative and is deeply invested in making wide broadband access a reality. Councilman Bob Blumenfield, who is spearheading the citywide Internet effort, said the program would boost the local economy as well as close the digital divide, a phrase that refers to a gap between those who can afford Internet and those who cannot. Companies have until November 12th to submit their proposals. The city's Department of Recreation and Parks, Council Districts 1 and 14 recently hosted a luncheon and preview of the upcoming Lotus Festival taking place in July. There will be lots of live performances as well, really great dances and singing and It'll be a great cultural experience for everyone. The Lotus Festival is held in July to coincide with the blooming of the flowers that are cultivated on the lake beds by city park crews. <laughs> LA's first responders compete on the court to encourage summer safety. Gil Reyes has more from USC. It's Chief versus Chief. Sporting different types of uniforms, the LA City Fire Department and the LA Police Department go head to head in a game of hoops. Make some noise! To bring the community out and uh, have a good time. Fans packed USC's Galen Center for the sixth annual Safe Summer Tip Off basketball game. The main point is to tell the kids to have a safe summer, stay out of trouble, take up sports and look to your police and fire departments if you ever need help for anything. They'll be around when over 30 parks and rec centers stay open after hours for summer night lights. The program keeps kids off the streets and out of trouble with supervised activities like sports. We see a spike in violent crime during the summer. The fire department sees a spike in medical uh, calls. So we got to emphasize, have a great summer, but have a safe summer. The LAFD on fire early. 
but the LAPD shoots and scores to take the lead. Final score, 53-77, LAPD wins. The police department always wins. You'll win too if you play it safe. At USC's Galen Center, Gil Reyes for LA This Week. Though LAFD appeared to be the crowd favorite at times, LAPD has won the annual game six years in a row. A mariachi music festival celebrates Latin music, a Peruvian guitarist sues the soul, and what does Beethoven and the Beatles have in common? Find out in this week's Things to Do. Proudly reaching an important milestone, Mariachi USA celebrates its 26 years on Saturday, June 27. It's the premier Mariachi music festival and the only annual Latino-themed event at the Hollywood Bowl for 26 consecutive years. The festival will showcase top Mariachi bands from the U.S. and Mexico. The event features traditional folkloric dances and the legendary fireworks display that together have made the event a cultural icon in L.A. The festival was created to give mariachi music a forum for artistic expression and a way to celebrate the rich musical traditions that so many have come to enjoy. Held at the Hollywood Bowl since its inception, the festival continues thrilling audiences of all generations. Rich musical traditions come to life at the Hollywood Bowl, located at 2301 Highland Avenue. For more details, visit mariachiusa.com. If you prefer the cool sounds of an acoustic guitar, Check out the Latin music of the Ciro Hurtado Band, performing at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art on June 27th. Peruvian guitarist and composer Ciro Hurtado has been actively performing since the early 70s. He is a musical director and a solo artist who has produced and recorded seven albums, including In My Mind and Tales From Home. Each of his compositions is paired with a story to illustrate the cultural and social context which brings his music to life. He was awarded the prestigious Durfee Master Musician Fellowship in 2001 and 2004. LACMA is located at 5905 Wilshire Boulevard. More details can be found at LACMA.org. The joyous sounds of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony perfectly pairs with Beatles hits like Penny Lane, Sgt. Pepper, Hey Jude, and more. The great music comes alive on Sunday, June 28th at the Walt Disney Concert Hall with Maestro Veneer and the California Philharmonic. Your spirits will swoop, soar and sparkle as the music fills the air. Don't miss this fabulous opportunity to make your musical experience even more fulfilling. The Walt Disney Concert Hall is located at 111 South Grand Avenue. For more, go to calphil.com. And that's a look at some things to do. And that's going to do it for this edition. I'm Yana Kay, and from all of us here at LA This Week, thanks for joining us. A reminder that you can catch us online at lacityview.org. You can also follow and like us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next week for more of LA This Week.